Hello and welcome to On Landscape. I'm sitting socially distanced from Joe Cornish here at On Landscape headquarters. Um, we are going to be talking about a, a project that you've been doing for quite a while. It's, a, it's actually a sequel project, isn't it, Joe? It is, Tim, yes. Uh, so, so uh, well, just also context, uh, where are we now? October, uh, October. and it's uh, 2020, the year of COVID-19. Yes. Um, and. Uh, and one of the really tough things for all for all of us outdoor photographers has been the restrictions on our activities uh, this year. Uh, for me, all of my workshops and tour plans were laid low, uh, really probably by the end of March. I mean, I, I, although I not, might not have cancelled them all then, but that's effectively what's ended up happening. However, I had one absolutely enormous uh, kind of redemptive characteristic for this year, and that I had another... Uh, assignment uh, anyway planned, which is a book on the landscape designer Sir Humphrey Repton, who uh, is often seen as a successor of Capability Brown. Which was the first project you... It was. And uh, four years ago, I completed a book on Capability Brown, uh, which has, has gone on to be quite successful, I believe, for uh, the publishers. And uh, it it's great fun to do, very different than what I normally do. Um, and I never really thought more of it. I thought that would be a one-off, but actually the, the publishers came back to me uh, a couple of years ago and asked if I'd be interested in working on the Repton project. At the time I had too many commitments, so I said, maybe you should look for somebody else, but they were very keen uh, that I do it. And so they literally displaced the project by a year. So I'm very grateful for that. Yeah. And Strangely enough, the year that I was due to shoot it, where I was expecting to have to dovetail it into all of the other uh, things that one normally does in a year, workshops, tours, and so on, um, it's turned out to be the one job I've had. Uh, so all through uh, since the beginning of the kind of lockdown period, in fact, that isn't quite how it worked because we couldn't uh, legitimately travel until June. Yeah. But since then, I have on and off worked on on this project. And I mean, I I don't know until you talked about Repton. I didn't know much about him. Is he is he geologically spread his his designs? It's rather like Brown. It's mainly uh, limited to England. Uh, uh, although uh, two of the places are in Wales, uh, and you know, to be clear, uh, and uh, you know, absolutely clear, these are essentially stately home estates yeah so it, it, it's not on the face of it my sort of thing but um you know i'm a working photographer so it's an opportunity to uh you know to be outdoors with my camera and problem solve and i, I that that's what's been great about it. it just to go back to your original point though there is a nice geographical spread in the sense that uh there are places in the south southeast the southwest uh, the, the West um, of Midlands, the, the East Midlands, East Anglia, and one in the North. Yeah. So it's predominantly in the South and the Midlands, but, um, but yes, it's also a, a place in the North. I'm not going to talk about, I will try to avoid using the specific names because I'd rather keep everything under wraps a little bit until Repton, yeah. until the book itself comes out. But, and, and what we're interested really is, hmm. is on landscape discussing this is how do you approach a project such as this? Um, where it may not be your things you would photograph normally, but you've you've been given a challenge, uh, both in terms of time, conditions, uh, subject, context, etc. Um, so, what were the challenges? How do you approach starting a project like this when somebody gives you a list of properties? Presumably, they give you a list of properties and types of things they want. Absolutely. I mean, the, uh, the it's fifteen properties. Uh, the 15 estates and uh, the, and the author who's a, a brilliant writer I must say and a really nice guy to work with um, has created lists for each of the 15 properties uh, and you know my my job is to try to uh, answer all the lists so if, if he says you know there'll, there'll be sometimes specific views sometimes specific details sometimes details of the house sometimes woodland, maybe garden, um, often features that, that the designer himself planned. Now, this is not an easy thing to do. 
because these uh, places were uh, most of the work that was done, the landscaping, uh, 200 years ago, so yeah. beginning of the 19th century, and uh, the, the and subsequently we've had generations and generations of owners who've been and gone. Uh, there have been two world wars. Uh, there's been massive social and cultural change, and ideas about landscape have clearly changed since Repton was around. And 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 so what you see today is not what Repton necessarily planned. Um, and so, uh, although uh, my my collaborator is is keen to be able to bring those features to life, sometimes they either don't exist or they've been subsumed under trees or yeah. vegetation, or they've been adapted. And a lot of growth, two hundred years. A lot of growth potentially, um, uh, and clearly there's been a massive amount of landscaping since. So what you're trying to do is to kind of show what there is today, uh, but at the same time make a connection with with what uh, the great landscape designer planned back then. And so, yeah, that, that's that been the endeavour, which is not that different to what I did for Brown, the Brown book. Well, let's have a look at some of the pictures. OK, well, uh, uh, I think what, what we'll do as we go through, because I've, I've got about 40 pictures to look through, so we'll try to run through them reasonably quickly. Um, but to give you an idea, some of the pictures like this, I, I wouldn't normally do a photograph like this with with the animals even but actually that's what makes it for me the picture is the animals and one of the things that, that's very much characteristic of both Repton and Brown is that their love of uh, of the idea of the park and the park is you know if we think of the idea of Savannah too you know has it got that connection almost to a primeval state hasn't yes, it um, yeah. of animals in the landscape um, and, and so it's a kind of conceit in a way yeah but they're working farms many of them there's a sense of an idealised landscape, isn't it? Is, were, were they yeah. working farms at the time? Was Repton designed them as farms? Or is this something they've become? Well, uh, you, you ask a good question. I, yeah. I think that, I don't think that these people, uh, it's just okay, by the way, yeah. we're using the F key, as it Absolutely, were, here in yeah. Lightroom, uh, just so we see them full screen. Um, and I'll, I'll just go through them, and, and we'll pick, as we talk, we can pick out individual features and problem-solving aspects along the way. Um, so uh, I'm trying to show the pictures of, by the way, not too close to the houses because I don't. I think that would be inappropriate. Yeah. Um, in in that regard, and I think you can see here, you know, uh, trying to ex exercise my love of of the of the landscape of of texture and and color, and and to try to create mood while at the same time answering the the problems that the author has given me uh, to convey place, a yeah. sense of place. And obviously, obviously the, the, um, the publisher didn't want a typological set of pictures of the properties. He, 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 think, he wanted you to give this uh, sense, of, uh, sense of context. Exactly. So here you have three different individuals involved. There's the publisher, there's the author, and there's the photographer. And the publisher's job is obviously t to tie the ends together. But, um, you know, the authorial story is the story of Repton um, and what his ideas about landscape were and how the landscape could be, quote unquote, improved for the, uh, the dignification of the, of the uh, owner. You know, because these uh, buildings are, in a sense, they are the kind of expression of wealth, power, and success of, uh, you know, of, of that, that 200 year ago period. You know, there were no super yachts or um, islands in the Caribbean or Ferraris um, with which to flaunt your wealth. A lot of that, the public face of this wealth and prosperity is expressed in these properties. This is the bling. In a way, yeah. yes, it is. Um, perhaps uh, the, the, and I, I think what I find fascinating about it is that, although it can be uncomfortable at times, um, but you see repeated over and over again how human beings, given that freedom to express themselves through their prosperity, uh, search for natural beauty and a connection with nature. You know, to me, that's a very powerful um, kind of, takeaway if you like and yes there's a control clearly control of, of the landscape and what what we're seeing here um this is just outside uh well this is a garden just outside uh, somebody's house looking across the parkland 
um, it's divided the working, you know, the garden, uh, this place of solace and reflection uh, is divided, in fact, from the park uh, by a ha-ha. And I'm not sure if I can use my cursor here, but if we look just here on the right-hand side of the photograph, that's just... The, the, the ha-ha, by the way, is a hidden feature, like a, a vertical wall and a trench, and then that, that slopes back into the, the land. Um, I'm sure some of our listeners will be familiar with it, but anyway, for those who are not... No, I wasn't familiar with it yet. So it's, it's basically, it's a hidden boundary that... that exactly, it's yeah. a sunken feature, so it's a conceit in a way, because it, 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 it's as if you are connected to the land, but, the, but you are, you are uh, protected from the inconvenience of having <laughs> animals, um, you know, kind of right up yeah. against the house, eating all your plants and flowers and vegetables, perhaps, if you grow them. Um, so that's, that's what it is. Um, on the other side of the of the house, they they uh, also have a what is effectively a wilderness garden. Uh, this particular place, um, I, I thought it was just stunning. Um, mm. The uh, you know this stage in the summer. By the way, we're looking at these at this series of pictures uh, chronologically, so various different places as I'm going through. But um, they're seen at, at now we're in June here, so it's kind of high summer. Um, this One picture, was, yeah, picture was made about nine, uh, nine twenty. So uh, how how long did you have to to photograph a property? I mean, what's the time constraints and and weather constraints? Yeah, good well? question. So blue sky. Would I normally shoot that? No, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, two days. Yeah. Um, so what, what was what you know? This is another thing that was great about this project. When I did the brown book, I often I had only half a day or a a, a day at most to photograph the properties, but with with the kind of lockdown or the absence of other things to do, I devoted two days to the photography. And essentially that doubles the amount of post-production time as well. So, you know, in in every sense, I've expanded the project to fill the much greater available time. Not that I'm not done anything else because I've, you know, also had gardening to do at home. And, and did that give you enough time to do a little bit of research for locations uh, and then go there? Or was it mostly reactive? Mostly reactive. Yeah. So, yes, I, I did um, look at maps uh, before I went. But rea the reality is, and you know what it's like, you, you know, when you, you arrive, the reality of, of what you're looking at is also very much dependent on the weather. And then what you think you might have been expecting turns out to be somewhat yes. different. Um, the other thing, this is a nice example of, uh, of the working photographer uh, elements of, of the book. You have to find double page spreads and you have to find a cover. So among these 15 properties, somewhere I need a cover picture. Yeah. And I know that my publisher favours a wraparound cover. Yeah. And so ideally what you want is essentially a picture that exists in isolation on the right yeah. but also can be extended. So this is a good example of an attempt to create a wraparound cover. If you imagine a central line down the middle of this picture and then expand it slightly, so it's the spine of the book, yep. the back doesn't need to be that distinctive, but at least conveys the atmosphere of an English parkland. And the front, you know, with the uh, stripes of the cast shadows and the animals creates depth. There's a stately home in the in the yeah. background, and then there's space enough for the title. And you, you had this in mind when you were wandering around. You sort of recognised moments. That At the, in the back of your work. mind, you're always thinking because they are the set piece images. Yes. They're the ones that that sell the book. And so I'm not saying this will be the cover. By the way, it's yeah. just one of the possibilities that that might be used. And you were mentioning your your camera has a uh, ability to put lines on. To yeah. Help so the. That. Phase Well, I'm sure most people's cameras do, don't they? But the phase one back in particular, you've got a, an easily switchable grid system on in the menu. So you access it immediately. You don't have to search through the menu and you can just go for a central grid, which is a center line, yes. um, horizontally and vertically. Uh, so w with a kind of bullseye in the middle, so it's very, very easy to see how uh, the page would divide up in that way. It'd be great if cameras had these preset masks you could put on for the exact size of a book yeah. with a spine and things. But yeah, certainly from a working yeah. point of view, that's really, really helpful. And this is um, what you might say is fairly typical of the kind of properties that I've been going to. You, know, you get lovely vistas of, of a very um, livable landscape, very fertile landscapes usually, uh, you know, a mixture of crops and grazing land. 
and woodland. Very important, the trees in particular. Um, many of these trees are older. I mean, the, the ones we're looking at here are probably around a hundred years old, so not, not as old as, as um, the, when the property was made, for example. And many of them too, this is a bit of an anomaly, but um, many of them are associated with uh, the prevailing religion of the day, clearly, um, Church of England in this case. And these, uh, the, the church building is quite a bit older than the property, but the property is developed around the village and the church. Yeah. And the, the pyramid on the right is a funerary monument of the landowner who commissioned okay. Repton. Yeah. Oh. So that, hence the link. And I've got a couple of versions of it. Um, I just wanted to uh, include both of them, partly because I, I kind of think they do make an interesting, which well, is very typical. So on day one, I had to take a picture and I was, it's in the middle of the day. It's made with interesting clouds and, and so on, but the sun is very high in the sky. Yeah. Uh, so there's somewhat of a, uh, the articulation of form and space is very dependent on the sky to provide a sense of depth. Whereas version two is a more archetypical landscape photographer's photograph of a sun, sunrise lighting low sunlight so you you have the foreground is shaded and the low sunlight picks out the pyramid monument uh with warm light obviously yeah. it's quite nice so you get the, the warm colors against the cool blue sky and having worked with a publisher would you can you i mean you can't second guess people but would they tend to prefer the, the typical landscape photographer's idea of what makes a good picture or do they have a... You know what? I ha I just don't know. Right. I'd love to yeah. be able to tell you. I yeah. don't know what they'll choose. Uh, but I'll certainly offer them both of them. Um, actually, one of the nice things about this project is that I can... Uh, you, they, they don't know what I've shot. Yeah. So although uh, I'm not saying that I would always try to honour my client's expectations, um, but I can still be in control of the editing. So I will generally only submit photographs that I'm happy with. Yeah. So uh, and, and not one that I'm not Fortunately, happy. you don't work with an art director who's over your shoulder no, telling you. No, it's actually a pretty nice work. I mean, I'm just literally wandering around with my camera, yeah. you know, for two days in a row in a place like this. This is a particularly ornate building. But you can see, just if I go back, sorry, um, that, you know, that might be a double page spread. But I'm thinking, mm, OK, the spine is going to go through the right hand side of the building. Will it work? I don't know. Um, Repton and Brown before him. Uh, the planting is obviously very important. So these cedars of Lebanon that you see on the right-hand side, mm. these are great feature, and these are, are, are probably ones that he planted at mm. the time. It's a sort of Mediterranean grand tour, romantic. There's uh, a link there, isn't there? Because link, it's not yeah. really a native. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, a lime avenue, which is another commonly, you know, expressed feature of these landscapes. Uh, this is an approach to the the original house. Um, limes are native and. Uh, that was that was actually uh, I've included this because again not a picture I would do for myself but problem solving wise I think many of our listeners will recognise just how dif difficult and tricky it is to do trees we to show the texture of them you don't generally want too much sunlight it tends to create very harsh contrast so this is shot at twilight um, but then actually the straight raw file the tree is really really dark and the sky is too bright yeah. So for me, part of the fun of this one was in an organic way, darkening the sky, lightening the trees in a way that looks like what you remember seeing. And presumably that's a, that's a problem you would have in many situations where you, you have quite difficult light to work with. It is. And, and again, you know, you, well, this is a different kind of problem, but, um, you know, part of the fun of, for me these days of doing photography is that I can work in these kind of lighting conditions. This is a sweet chestnut in the same same property, but in a different part of it. And uh, and the power of a digital file, very much like a color negative, if you think back to, to shooting film, you know, you, you can work with the highlights and shadows to restore um, luminance and contrast in areas that Certainly with transparency film would have been really, really difficult. I mm. probably wouldn't have shot this picture yeah. on transparency film. Uh, or if I had, it would have been a, a devil of a job to, you know, to, to hold the shadows and highlights. I, that's the sort of picture that I personally really enjoyed shooting. Yeah. It's shot in rain and uh, with, a, with a long lens. So it's 100 to 400 mil on a Sony right. rather than on a, yeah. on a Lindhoff. 
and uh, I love the fact that the tree seems to have a, a kind of skull at the top of it. I've just noticed that myself. Yeah. Great, it's a great boss yeah. in the tree, and it's got this kind of ah, wonderful, gnarly, ancient character. Um, that tree probably 300 years old so yeah. probably already there when Repton worked on that landscape and here's a snag of a of another tree in the same piece of woodland um i'm not even sure what time presumably it would have been working in places it may have been arboretums as well which are quite interesting trees they've been planting yes uh yeah exactly yeah. uh and and of course there's a continuity in these environments so uh, the snag may may be a tree that that you know first started growing 400 years ago the trees around it are uh, probably 50 or 60 years old or less so they're, they're ongoing so here's a picture that might be a bit curious a bit different yeah. for me uh, but one of the uh, interesting things about this woodland is that it's being managed using highland cattle okay for the uh, understory yes and that at the moment that uh, that they're doing a, a very good job of of, of clearing the, there's a lot of ragwort in that wood um, and bracken and and they these cattle I believe can tolerate and they do eat it and then as they do so they uh, they they also trampling through the, the the wood it disturbs the soil and that encourages other plants yeah. uh, to grow so it I believe it increases biodiversity and this was part of the, uh, a story that they wanted to tell in the book as well it is yeah yeah, yeah. Um, well at least it's and in that way, that's this is a modern thing. This is not a Repton thing. Yes. But yeah. but my my author is um, is also you know bringing it up to date, I suppose, through yeah. modern um, woodland practices. In fact, it's the National Trust who are managing this particular bit of bit of woodland. Um, incidentally, from a photographic point of view, that is handheld uh, at ISO sixteen hundred. Yeah. With a hundred to four hundred mil lens on with stabilizer, so. I mean, forgive me for giving all the technical details, but it's, you know, it's kind of interesting that uh, you can use these modern cameras to take pictures, which at least at this scale of enlargement will probably work really quite well. Yeah. And one of the things that I do a lot more making book pictures is work with a long lens. So again, this is shot with a with 100 to 400 probably. Is, that, is this that because of basically problem solving again that yeah. gives you it gives you the ability to work from a distance and uh, sample areas in a different context it's exactly that uh, in in a sense that it's more illustrative um, and I'm not as concerned about the emotional connection as I am typically for my personal work and the other thing is with woodland um, with this kind of photography you you are looking to minimize the sky um, mm which otherwise can be very dominant when you use a wide angle lens for pictures where you clearly have to look at quote unquote subject matter. Yeah. I mean, I'm very much believe in photography and in relationships and that uh, the, the, the kind of visual, uh, you know, in totality, what pictures are composed of is relationships. And so, you know, like, okay, you look at a picture like this and oh, it's a house. Well, is it? No, the house is in the picture. But for me, what, what makes it interesting is how to combine all these different elements, the textures. This is shot with a standard lens, by the way. And so that's a 70 millimeter on a Linhof. Um, the oak tree and the, and the trees that surround uh, the house, which create the belt, the comforting embrace for the house that is so much part of that type of landscape design, um, are very important. But what gives the picture, uh, I think what helps it to work is the texture of the land and the way that the light, the light and shade draws us through the picture space towards the house. So it's the relationships of these are dewdrop covered, you know, grasses in the foreground, you know, then there's that little strip of sunlight and then more shade and then sunlight beyond. So it's all of those things working together. And I don't think in terms of when I make pictures like this, in in terms of subject matter, I'm thinking thinking relationships. Yeah. So again, probably pictures I wouldn't that previous picture I probably wouldn't have shot personally, but I've tried to. I love doing it. Um, this picture, on the other hand, was not asked for. <laughs> I shot it because I um, 
I love shooting woodland. Yes. Um, so or, or photographing in woodland. And this is actually is a lime avenue. So it was planted. Uh, the owner of, of the house believes it was planted as a memorial at the end of the First World War uh, to the fallen of yeah. the village. And I found it very moving, actually, from purely from that point of view, um, to be in the Lime Avenue. Um, OK, obviously, that comes from my own imagination, but I also was struck by how fast trees grow, you know? I mean, yes, are, that's not a long time, really, is it? Hundred, these are 100 years old, these yeah. trees, but, you know, they look like they've been there forever. Um, so... Uh, yeah, very, you know, and that's a lot, a lot of the properties came into ruin, I think, didn't they, in, after the First World War? Many did. Because so many of the family were lost. Many did, uh, yeah, so that economically, so yeah, fascinating. I mean, I'm not a historian, I'll be careful what I say, uh, but my my uh, sort of thoughts about it, you know, in the post-World War One era, is this is an era of immense social change, you know, and the upper classes, you know, were devastated by the war, as were all of them the class structure throughout, um, you know, England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland and beyond. And uh, the, the, there were economic, massive political change. Um, the economic circumstances clearly didn't favour the upper classes in the way they had in the past. So they suffered and some of them had to relinquish their property. Others were able to keep, by the way, that last one, that, that is typical problem solving. I was asked for a picture of this lane that led you know again okay, yeah. not something i would have shot perhaps but i really enjoyed making this picture and this is shot with a long lens and the the main um sort of visual problem you're trying to solve is how do you get rid of the sky yeah condense it enough so that it's not too forced but still conveys a sense of of depth and um you know so and using the light on a day when it was very sunny no, you know, middle of the summer in East Anglia, uh, and and so yeah, you, you're working with harsh lighting. Yeah, uh, and so here I feel that the texture of the trees, while it's harsh in the sense that there's sunlight and shadow, but um, there's sufficient filtering through leaves, you know, to soften uh, the impression, and then not have it, avoiding the sky, enables you to combine the dark and the light elements together effectively. And that's the challenge of photographing something that's inherently not particularly interesting, isn't it? How to, what do I bring in? I mean, the, yes. the, the photograph is of the, the road, but the, what you've created is a photograph with the, with the context. Hopefully, yeah. L light and... Uh, and a little bit of surround. intrigue. You know, something at the end of that, uh, of, of the lane, uh, a building, just sort of, you know, different colour and, and so on. Anyway, um, whereas this picture was, I shot purely for myself, and, and this was shot... Uh, so. By now, the, the 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 convection heat has built up during the day. There's a few clouds floating around, so every few minutes there's a few seconds of cloud cover, and yeah. those are the moments when I will shoot a picture like this, yeah. because the light is sufficiently softened that there's and yes, you can see there's this sky which is burnt out in the distance. Here's one of the things that we uh, I, I find myself. Um, fascinated by in our culture of photography today. Um, I, I know that people are very nervous and anxious about burnt out highlights, photographers are generally, and I, I absolutely understand why that's the case. However, the picture like this, it, it isn't relevant. So if, you, if the highlights are, are restrained within the composition, you, you, there's just no way in the world you can hold um, texture where there's a bit of patch of white no, sky. No. So the question you have to ask yourself is, is that patch of white sky destroying the photograph or can you live with it within the context? And I don't know about you, but personally I can. Yeah. Um, what I will sometimes do when I'm confronted by patches of white skies, rather than try to re re uh, hold the highlights, is I actually burn it out a bit more. Yeah, so you get a glow rather than a, yeah. a, a small... Yeah, so that, that's right. That can be done in numerous different ways. Technically, it can be done just by reducing contrast in the areas surrounding the highlights, or it can be done with a bit of dehaze the other way. So it's going left with uh, with yeah. that control in, in Lightroom. So you, you might introduce 10 to 20% of haze. Um, but it just, it just softens the boundaries. 
Yes. So that instead of the leaves being very harsh at that point, you actually lighten them. Because it's the hard edges that attract the eye when you get things clipping. It's a contrast. Yeah. It's too much contrast. So here, well, clearly the emphasis is, is around the ivy that appears to be strangling these trees. Now, whether it is strangling the trees or whether it's, it's living in a sort of symbiosis, I'm not sure. But um, to me, that's what makes the picture. It's the ivy and it's kind of, it's... It's irrepressible kind of fertility. Well, this brings to you. You've just written an article for the magazine about metaphor and analogy and and and, and including narrative about strangulation, yeah. yes. which may not be true, but it works visually. I think visually, it, it's uh, it, it should question. You know the you know I think if you have a curious uh, uh, um, viewer, they'll you know think, oh well, that's it, it's can you articulate the picture in a way that makes it sufficiently interesting to be engaging yeah. ultimately. This is not a great picture, but I've included it because it, it's actually uh, it's unbelievably difficult to shoot technically. Yeah. Um, and because the, the, this particular feature, which is a trench around the property that uh, Repton designed, had to be illustrated in some way. And, you know, I just found this particular part of it, which I felt solved the problem of showing the trench, but actually had some interesting features in it yeah. as well, uh, where it wasn't completely covered in vegetation, actually. Um, and also in direct, in direct sunlight, but anyway. It's, you have a little bit of sense of despair when you turn up at a location like this. I oh think I've got my to try and focus goodness, this. it's so hard. I can't <laughs> tell you. And uh, it, it is done with one exposure. I didn't do an exposure blend. Um, yeah. One of the good things about modern digital cameras and this, this was shot with a phase one, you know, you have these extraordinary dynamic range. But the question is then, how do you render that to look natural? Yeah. And that was the hard part here. I won't go into what, why yeah. and how that was done, because that's not what this story is about. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure that maybe that's something that we can look at in the future. But I'm a great believer in if it doesn't look natural, then I, I have a real problem with that. I, I find I'm not engaged. I find myself too busy looking at the process. What I'm really interested in is the landscape. Yes. You know, how do we how do we tell the story of the landscape? These I just love these. I love beech trees. And uh, my author wanted a picture of this particular side of the walled garden. I mean, it's an, a, a very a non, a non malouse picture. Yes. In many ways, when you when you look at it, well, what, what is it? Two very old beech trees. Um, and there's a sweet chestnut beyond because you can see those huge leaves on the left hand and a side. A bit of scraggy wall behind it. Yeah, a bit of scraggy wall. And why is it that under beech trees it's often quite stark? Well, I found out the other day, but actually that beech um, beech husks uh, tend to be uh, that they, they actually are they do inhibit growth oh, okay. uh, underneath them. So often in a beech forest, yeah. although there are, well, are some plants that can coexist, but um, in certain environments beech trees are quite difficult to live with yeah. for other plants so there might be a few bluebells will typically will yeah. live here but others other plants can't um, also by the way just quickly that shot with a linhof technical camera and masses and masses of rising front yeah or or, or rear drop if you prefer um, so it's a nice picture to shoot with a technical camera because you can preserve that the vertical emphasis without the trees having to sort of fall into one another yes yeah. and and again another i think it's a beach um i you know i wasn't asked for this picture but i just was you know fell in love with this tree when i saw it and i wanted to to make a picture of it again you know shooting into the light so what what that produces is this rather kind of it's a slightly highlight dominated but there's a lot of ambient light around and um and there's a softness to the light, a light, light as a result of shooting into the light. Yeah. Is this another one where, you, where you've created that slight softness, probably with the yes. um, reducing negative reducing depth. contrast yeah. or negative clarity? So as it, it looks were. like it looks like a glowing light source rather than a burnt out. Yeah, spot. which is actually kind of how the eye sees it. Um, yes, absolutely. You know, in, in, yeah. in situ, but of course there's a little bit of um, yeah, we're still at the same place actually here. This is um, a bit uh, of a you, gift from nature. Oh, I mean, I. Uh, that is not a technique. That is real mist. You know, I think it's called radiation mist or yeah. radiation fog, just lying in a hollow. Um, Beautiful. I was, yeah. But it's so, where, when you're in a situation like this, you're like, your heart's racing. <laughs> you know, it's not exactly the relaxing kind of emotion it, it, it appears to be because 
you, you just so want to be able to hold that moment. Um, and, and also, you know, as you can imagine, there's a few technical problems that have to be solved. The sky is significantly brighter. Yeah, we're trying to be a sheep whisperer the to land. get them in the right place. In the exactly, picture. yeah. Whereas actually, all you can do is timing. Yes. And um, I got lucky. Also, and, and, and here's another one from the same place, but you can see a number of these compositions are made with the mind to cut them in half. Yes. Uh, with the page. There's another property here, and you know, blue skies, blue skies. This is summer in in the southeast of England. What you can do about it, isn't and it? we had a pretty sunny summer yes. uh, from memory. Uh, so you've got to find ways of uh, of accepting uh, the the problem of the blue sky and and work with it. Do you use a polarizer much in these situations? Uh, this is not polarized. No. Uh, I, I'm always aware that it's a possibility, uh, and it can work in your favour. Um, here. It, probably wouldn't have done. So I don't know, you, you don't tend to use a polarizer that often, I don't think. I, I don't, but I, I'm not biased against it. Yeah. it. It's just it has to work uh, in context. It has to be, quote unquote, invisible. If I can see it, I'm not yeah. happy with it. This is a lovely constructed picture. Thank you. Yeah, well, that, that is very, yeah, you're, you're right. It's very, very deliberately seen. I mean, the, the fixing the tripod for this was unbelievably difficult because I've got two legs in the lake. <laughs> And, um, you know, I'm trying not to crush the understory where I am standing. Well, I'm, I've got one foot in the lake with my Wellington boots on. And um, it's, it's also quite a technical picture done with a, with a uh, Linhoff. So there's quite a bit of tilt uh, shot with a wide lens. Uh, and at the same time, I'm trying to keep the, uh, the, the building, which is a, you know, is a, a, a lovely little folly. Um, you know, the lines of that should be vertical, so there's a lot of drop front equivalent. And at the same time, shooting into the light, so um, I, I had to decide, do I want to filter down the sky or am I going to accept it burning out? And I did accept yeah. it. And I, that's the sort of picture I could easily have polarised. I couldn't tell you now whether I did, I can't remember. Um, but I would certainly consider it for a small fragment of blue sky yes. if it helped to create the right degree of separation between yeah. yeah the lily and the and the sky reflection than, than I would. I think we'll obviously have to move along a little bit more quickly to get through these. Yeah. Um, but the uh, this is a, an example of um, actually you, you know the phase one back has a has a kind of built-in HDR feature. Um, yeah, you were telling me about this yesterday. Mm. I didn't know much about it. So. Yeah, it, it, it's still it, if you if you really look closely, you can definitely see that it's shot that way. I mean, maybe I haven't processed it very skillfully, but uh, I'm seeing a little bit of a halo around it's that. More subtle than many, I've seen. But it, yeah, well, I mean, thank you. But it, yeah. it, it's um, it's it is quite difficult to get that that feel right. Uh, I think actually the sky here should probably be a little bit brighter. Um, because I can see that that became a bit heavy on that left hand side but what what the idea is how do you how do you convey naturally um, something where you have an inside light outside light environment and the brain can map that yeah relatively easily but it's much harder to do in photography uh, but it's quite an interesting challenge oh, that's <laughs> magnificent <laughs> yeah. this, this just had to be put in because uh, this is just so cute. I'm sure this is done for the children of the family. Yes. Elephant and, uh, yeah, mother elephant and still two cubs. Lovely constructed picture still. Thank you. Yeah, quite a bit of, um, yeah, it was very soft light. So again, you've got to find ways of getting the sky, the atmosphere of the, uh, the sky to hold. Do you have to think about anything in particular, knowing it's going to be in a published book? In, uh, it's this, that, I think, uh, well, actually, it's a good question. I think the horizontal, uh, well, to go back to our earlier point, the horizontals are often, I'm thinking, is there a picture on one side and a picture on the other? Yeah. So this might not be used that way. Even if it's a double page spread. Like yeah, if it's a double page spread. If it's used as a, as a singular page on a single, mm -hmm. you've, you've still got to think, is it a coherent composition? I mean, you could argue that the elephants are a little bit displaced to the left. But for me, that works okay because I can see there's that very bright bit of sky on the top right, yeah. and there's a kind of correspondence. There's an, entry and a, there's a, and there's an energy yeah. flow there that works for me. And do, do you have any idea about when some pictures, maybe like the equivalent of B-roll, 
they're going to be subsidiary pictures that Probably. are printed smaller, so that oh, one definitely. needs to be a bit bolder. Uh, yes, good point. Uh, I think some are, I'm not necessarily showing many of those, by the way, yeah. but um, yeah. but yes, you're right. When you know that a picture is there because it's being used purely from a point of view of illustration of subject matter and theme, um, you often have to shoot them a bit bolder. More obvious. And yeah. more obvious yeah. and, you know, graphic. Whereas pictures that uh, I'm excited about and want to show, uh, this is an example that does both, that it illustrates a feature, but where I'm happy about the problem solving side. So you can probably imagine that the feature here is the bridge, yeah. top left, um, and, and the author asks for a picture of the bridge. Um, but actually the bridge in isolation is not a particularly exciting feature. And unfortunately, when I arrived there, uh, the gardeners had been doing a lot of clearance work just to the left of the bridge with the result there's quite a lot of exposed soil so you don't really it does look very harsh around it um, and and the, the lake is a beautiful feature of the landscape but uh, for, for there were various reasons why I couldn't make an obvious picture work although in fact subsequent to this you'll, you'll see another one but I felt that this uh, is such a strong characteristic of walking around the lake with this lovely wild grasses and um, the uh, the lakeside vegetation which are, you know the the water loving plants that grow with their feet in the water uh, around the edge of the of the lake um, and that's what I wanted to to try to do so I'm combining those characteristics along with the feature on the left hand side it's a lovely example of a, of a a photograph that looks like a just a, a quickly seen Im um, context, a, a scene that you've looked at. <laughs> yeah, snap, yeah. essentially. Yeah. Um, but it is actually very well put together and composed, and it's working quite hard uh, to draw people's attention to different areas. And I like that. I like that combination of you know you're Thank looking you. at something that isn't the photographer's not shouting at you. It's important to if they feel natural. I mean, the, the 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 hardest thing, you know, from which we'll all know. Listen, everybody listening to this knows it's very difficult to get the sky and shadows to work together, um, especially where you don't have a, a, an obvious boundary. Sometimes a graduated filter can solve that problem. Uh, sometimes I, I, I we've talked about this in previous articles, but I did actually use a graduated filter here. But then you've got to find ways of of lifting. Uh, those areas that are covered by the graduated filter, which have now been darkened excessively. The, the tree but, at the top right. Uh, the top left, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And also because you can angle the filter, so the probably the top, very top right's not so affected, but... Um, Branch right over the sky is. Yeah, yeah. fortunately, the mo modern sensors are so powerful that they, they do have enough shadow detail that with a bit of thoughtful... Although this looks like quite an extreme challenge. Five stops, five stops of yeah. filtration. Um, I'm I'm sure there will be uh, many listeners who, who would have said, "Well, why didn't you just do it with HDR?" And yes, you could have done absolutely. Um, it's just it's just whatever the your preferred working method. Mm. And for me, um, I I I I'm very, I guess, uh, what's the word? I need the feedback. I love the feedback. I I used to quite often shoot Polaroids when I was shooting film not so much doing my own work but uh, for book but for book photography where I had to solve problems and be sure one of the things I love about digital is the feedback I get on, at the time and although I can do combi combine exposures if it has to be done I love to shoot with a filter and know in my mind in my heart that the feeling of the light is right and then I do the mitigation work in post-production yeah. Um, so that's how I've worked here, and I don't mind bright highlights being burned out. I can, I, I actually think that that's appropriate. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, if we look at, at these textures here, these to me add something to the character of the picture. Whereas if you'd shot an exposure for the foreground, yeah, then you wouldn't have got anything here. Mm. So actually, seeing that rendered on the on the original one original file for, has helped me in the visualization process so yeah. uh, I, you know th this is a a composition that has its kind of challenges 
and I, but it's not, it's really about the feel of it. This is where we've talked in the past, it would be great, being as the camera can record all this in, in one or two shots, say. Yeah, yeah. It'd be nice if you could do some of this slight post-processing on the back of the camera in yeah, order to be able would. to visualise things. Well, I guess that's the next step. Yeah, I think and, so. uh, at some it, point. it has to be in a raw file, doesn't it? Yes, I mean, yeah. Otherwise, why bother? Yeah. So, um, yeah, may, maybe we'll, we'll get there. I hope so. Um, so moving on, uh, you can see this is a very functional photograph, needed a, pi a picture of the church on the hill. Um, and again, uh, because from the property, it's a long, long way away, you're talking 250 millimeter focal length or yeah. something like that. Um, and uh, I mean, this is an, uh, definitely not a picture I would have shot for myself, um, but I can see it working well in the book. Mm. It's English landscape personified in a way, yes, isn't it? That's sort of the, the elements of the land. It's almost like an element-based composition. Um, but I'm happy enough with it. Uh, going back to that uh, lake again, uh, th there's a, a little, a lovely little pier. And I, I can see that, you know, some compositional flaws in this picture. But I mean, mainly it's about atmosphere. And, um, and one of the things I, I see now looking back through this body of work is is that in the absence of it, it, it it's a, you know if you think of what you were doing as a as a landscape designer humphrey repton capability brown or whatever you aren't creating a photograph you're creating a three-dimensional experience or, or trying to contribute to the kind of uplifting of of, of place um, and so a photographer's challenge is how do you try to share those attributes and three-dimensional space mm. in in two-dimensional imagery and and in a group of photographs and ultimately as as what you hope the book will be a work of art um, a series of pictures which help to reinforce balance contrast and so on and the, the the there is two underlying themes for me i've had to solve all, the, all this problem largely in one summer moving now into autumn um, and I think the unifying feature for me is texture and colour so it's not really about I mean it's about composition don't get me yeah. wrong but the but the compositions are quite quiet and quite subtle because it's in the nature of this uh, work uh, that the the trees are you know and, and plants are all organic um, you know, we're not looking at rock features. There's hardly any rocks in any of these pictures. Um, it's about mood, feeling, atmosphere, you know, space, depth, and hopefully emotional depth. And that it's, it's the richness of the land, the kind of embracing, um, fertile, uh, subtle, subtlety of it that, that I think is, is common. And I guess what I found myself looking at and increasingly looking for is elements of colour and texture that, that give me joy. Thank you very much, Joe. So in, we're, not, we're almost there, Tim. So okay. I'll just I'll quickly run through the yes, last absolutely. ones. Um, and uh, but you, you can just to, well, yeah, there's a few trees. Um, and as I think these are, this is the last place I went to. And yes, it's still lighting. Nice but, conditions. Yeah, and nice conditions. And I think... And is the project over? That's the last one. If you photograph no, the last... I'm afraid not. I'm, no, I've still got the last few uh, will be done with awesome colour. Um, so, yeah, lucky me. I've just... I mean, it's been a real a real solace for me to work on, on this project. And it's been great fun, you know, having my working photographer hat back on again. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Cheers.